All right, some context for this. Apparently, the red team leader here, spawning on the sea lane of Supreme Isthmus, was terrorizing this lobby of players that were enjoying one of these well-renowned Beyond All Reason maps. And so, supposedly, the blue team decided to take it into their own initiative to come up with a plan to counteract the forces of K Corp. 36 True Skill and Silver Chevrons to boot, apparently going to be leading the red team here to, well, ap apparently, potentially another victory, supposedly. It's, uh, it's up in the air right now. Apparently, this lobby came hot off the tails of a long list of defeats at the hand of the Red Menace. So we'll see what the blue team can cook up in order to counteract the prowess of this dominating leader over here in Cortex Firetruck Red, all the way across the map, spawning on the geothermal position, hopefully leading the blue to victory today goes by the name of Fruit. Now, 42 true skill is quite high up there. Definitely well within to pro level. I think pro level is probably around 40s at this point. That's wild, that used to be 30, it used to be 25. Oh, how things have changed over time, my friends. <laughs> you can go watch some of those earlier casts if you feel so inclined. You're always welcome to dive back into the archives of the Brightworks and check out some of the uh, older Brightworks videos. <clears throat> they might not be as good, but I sure hope you'll probably enjoy them. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> you can definitely tell the game has changed quite a lot from back then. A couple of changes you might also recognize to Supreme Isthmus is the fact that it was, well, at one point called Supreme Straits, and the geothermal spot was not here. It was actually uh, closer to over here-ish, maybe a little bit further back, kind of over in this uh, this spot over here. Essentially, it was a lot further away from the water, and what that meant that was that it was a lot safer from the water, so you couldn't be barraged by, say, for instance, those T2 battleships that were firing away from over here, but it also meant that bombing runs were a little bit easier to stop. Not entirely easy, still quite a short rush distance. I think the geothermal, instead of being here, I think it was moved about over to here. So you can imagine that distance, right, is not very, not very large regardless, but did offer you a little bit more protection back in the day. Nowadays, not the case. Oh, this is lovely. This is actually a really refined build right here. What we're seeing on the front, by the way, is mass grunt spam right here from taxation is theft. Love to see it because we do have dual res bots out on the front eating up these rocks and plants. Love to see that because it does mean that, well, obviously, if you're eating up the rocks and plants, it means you can produce more grunts, and more grunts means you're securely able to eat up those rocks and plants. It's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy right there, and I love that Taxation is Theft is doing that. Why I say this is such a precise build, I can already tell, is because of the placement of this very first construction turret. You can see that it's just barely within range of all three metal extractors here, which means that this is a practice build. Fruit definitely knows what they're going for. This might be a great lesson on exactly how to go for a very, very precise timing attack here on Supreme Isthmus. I think I'll keep my camera right Right here as we can keep a track on the minimap here to see some damage looks like some green rovers are across the map dealing damage to the maroon base snipe a metal extractor front line though is well held right here by taxation is theft so what are we going for right here essentially the idea is to rush up the geothermal the geothermal is obviously one of the most efficient ways to get energy in the game t1 and t2 geothermals very very efficient you can see energy being shared by the way to the blue commander making sure that there's enough energy to rush out this geothermal is really really key to making the strategy work because if the blue commander stalls for energy right here it's going to be a painful painful time resbot's also contributing quite a lot you can see 170 ish energy per second when they're all three reclaiming at the same time it's a little bit fluctuative but overall it does mean that uh, the blue team is going to have or at the very least the blue commander is going to have a fabulous economy the marine commander also has the geothermal up and running by the way but we don't see the very uh, precise construction oh actually we do all right china geo doing a great job here with the geothermal placement building some of those uh construction towers here the reason why this is important, by the way, is so that when you go to upgrade your mexes, you can upgrade your geothermal and all three of your, all four of your, pardon me, uh, metal extractors here off of just a, a couple of construction turrets. They can do it all. They can reach every single spot right here. Makes for a very, very powerful build. Red Team Leader has gone into the water right here, interestingly enough. Goes into the pond in order to uh, try and, yeah, try and potentially get some of those boats out onto the high seas. Oftentimes difficult to get the boat out over here, but this is a much more powerful, uh, much more standard version, I think, nowadays. I feel like we see this a lot more often. The uh, the the protected cove start right here for the naval start for the sea lane player. It does scale quite well if you get a T2 metal or a T2 constructor, pardon me, up and running, because it does mean you get that T2 economy plus the T1 boats. And the T1 boats are quite effective against virtually everything. Wow, what a quick T2. My goodness, four minutes and 30 seconds we complete that T2 lab. That is absolutely astonishing right here. Tons and tons of help from the rest of the team. You can see uh, Grico Bratko helping quite a lot from the backline over here. Instead of going for attack in the backline, just goes for some economy and then transports the commander to help build a whole bunch of this. Love to see that. Technically speaking, it's the much more efficient route of getting things done because it means you don't have two players spending a whole bunch of metal on T2 labs. You just have the one. 
Now, are we going to propagate T2 here? I think the plan is Mauser into T2. Looks like we have one more Mauser under production, and then eventually we're going to switch up to T2. Love those Mauser, though. I mean, this is still a full-blown T1 army right here. Absolutely no T2 in sight for the red team. It means that those Mauser are going to have a tremendous day on the range here, blasting away at everything that the red team has to bring to offer. Spooky Dookie as well as Habgear are about to feel the sting of those long-range T2 artillery pieces. It can be quite, quite painful. T2 Lab almost all the way done right here. We're about halfway done, and the metal from the commander will finish it off right here for the Maroon Commander, who does have a very slick build here, just doesn't have quite as much support from his teammates. You can see T2 in the back line over here. Being used to transport constructors around, it does look like... Uh, maybe not. Hopefully we get some T2 constructors out here from the Orange Commander, otherwise this is essentially all for naught. And there we go. T2 is up and running, and so some of those Quakers are going to hit the field here eventually, but the Mauser are already on the field, and they're firing away. Mouths are a little bit less powerful as far as raw DPS goes. Actually, I don't know about DPS. The the raw damage number, I mean. The actual impact of the the uh, projectile on the floor. Still, though, doesn't really matter when they're going up against essentially their most effective target right here, which would be T1 bots. Bots and static defense. I don't think so. I don't think it's going to matter all too much. Yeah, these Quakers are absolutely beautiful. Sorry, the Mauser. Quaker will eventually hit the front lines, but this uh, front line has already been basically dissolved. Yeah. Big fight on that side right there. Really, really nicely done. Nice defense right there from Habgear. Manages to deflect a lot of it. There's a lot of medium tanks. So for what we traded, I think it was probably well worth it. Yeah, Janus is firing away as well right there. All right, not bad. Finally, the Quaker hits the field. And we do have more coming, I do believe. Yeah, Maroon Commander about to pump out a whole bunch more Quakers. What a beautiful little build here. So this is one of those lovely things about Supreme Isthmus, is everybody's had time to perfect their builds right here, so we get to see some of the absolute top-of-the-top-line builds, the most efficient builds coming out to play here. You can see already on the front lines we have seven-minute full saturation... Uh, what are these called again? Mausers. Now we're going to the Aegea. We've eaten up the T2 Constructor, the T2 Laboratory, pardon me. Did we hand out a T2 Constructor? We did not. Mm. It's one of those things that I think I'd like to see is handing out a T2 Constructor. I know it slows down the build quite a bit, but handing out that T2 Constructor really does help out quite a lot. We're starting up more construction turrets here, by the way. Tripling that build power. Or, uh, no, sorry. Point, point three, 1.3, 1.3xing the build power? There we go, more or less. <laughs> Three on top of five. You can feel free to do the math. I can't be bothered, not during a live commentary. Ah, uh, the Mauser I handed over. I love that move as well. Yeah, the blue team really looking coordinated here. I love when a team is driven to coordination by the, uh, the oppressors trying to constantly apply pressure, and then suddenly it means that they have to break out all the stops right here. Just goes to show that the most powerful, most powerful tactic, and beyond all reason, every single time, every single time we talk about it, the most powerful tactic will always be teamwork. The power of friendship is real. IRL and beyond all reason alike. Okay, Corp, taking a lot of damage right there, but the Destroyer does go down, leaving these frigates a little bit exposed. Yeah, Quaker's pulled off the front line. I don't think that's the move. I think you continue to apply pressure here. Sorry, Mauser were pulled off the front line. I keep getting the Mauser and the Quaker mixed up. The Mauser are uh, in blue. The Quaker are in red. I think these Quakers should probably push back right now, since the Mauser were pulled. Heated naval battles on both sides, by the way. Egril trying to set up quite a lot of frigates in order to fight away with the Red Commander K-Corp. Don't mind the frigate play. I'm so unconfident nowadays, though. Vanaja has been absolutely destroying me live on the streams, in case you're curious. Oh, that's just cheeky. We've gone for a nuclear bomber here. Interesting. Okay. I like it. Early nuclear bomber can certainly do quite a lot of work here. It is going to go ahead and target down the Navy. This is a great target for it because all these Navy units are so metal dense. It's such a good such a good use of resources because you know that you're going to get some sort of a decent trade right there. There we go. Take it down to Destroyer. Those are 960 metal, nearly 1,000 metal immediately wiped off the map right there. Beautifully, beautifully done. You do have to be careful. You really can't lose this nuclear bomber. It's such a heavy investment. Interesting. We're going into T2 vehicles once more. So we really are just rushing out the single nuclear bomber. Okay. I mean, not the end of the world, but it is, uh, it is interesting. I mean, I wonder if maybe two of those wouldn't have been the worst idea. No? It takes two nuclear bombs in order to pop a commander in a single run. Certainly means you can get some crazy efficient trades by just setting the target on top of a commander's head and then flying your bomber over it. Oh, nice nuke right there, though. Beautiful, beautiful nuclear bomber play. 
That's really, really special. Love to see that. Yeah, the nuclear bomber rush. Very powerful here. Love that play. It may not seem like the biggest connection in the world, but we are drastically cutting down the metal allotted to each of these armies, right? K Corp lost nearly a thousand arm, a thousand metal. Plus the fact that the Navy was right here to engage as well meant that it really ended up being quite a bit more. Plus the reclaim for whatever was left went back to egg roll here. It definitely sets the spiral back in the blue team's direction. It's the kind of support that you're really, really hoping for when you're playing that front line and desperately waiting for something to happen. Nice Janus connections over here. Beautiful Janus connections. Yeah, there you go. A whole bunch of those Rocketeers. Exactly how you want to use the Janus's. Dip them into combat. Pull them forward in a nice little line until they all fire and then immediately pull them back out of combat. No reason to keep them around while they're recharging their guns. The connections over here have vastly equ uh, equal... Sorry. Redo. Retake. <laughs> Cut. They've drastically equalized the economies over there. Another massive nuclear connection, by the way, on the left-hand side. Oh, the bomber's in trouble. Oh, it's in trouble. Ah, we are going to snipe the nuclear bomber. Fair enough. Fair enough. After that much damage, the nuclear bomber had to go. I think that's probably a fair air pull right here from the pink commander, who actually does win the air battle right there. Definitely a sign that we should go for a little bit of bombing ourselves if you end up winning the air battle like that. Does give the opportunity, though, for these frigates to jump on top of this. Is this the right move, though? I mean, realistically, these frigates jumping on top of this base eventually are going to go down and leave a bunch of metal on the red player's doorstep. If we don't do lethal damage with these frigates immediately, this could be... This could end up re refeeding that metal back to the red player here. Ah, it's one of those tricky things about the naval play. It's so snowbally. Now we have Starlights on the front line, though. Very difficult to deal with. So good at blasting away at basically anything on the front. Sometimes a little bit too good. That's essentially how you counter them, is sending a whole bunch of stuff for them to fire at. They don't have a high fire rate, but every time they do, they blast something to smithereens. Punching a quarter-sized hole straight through anything that they fire at. Lightning tanks included. Do we have any pinpointers? I would love a pinpointer or two. Oh, we're just going to go into mass spam here. Feels like a little bit of a cheap response, but honestly, I don't hate it. Mass spam on this sort of a thing, especially with the Starlights already up in front. I mean, this is an incredibly powerful army, and there's virtually nothing that we have right now from the red team in order to stop this. So yeah, actually going for some T1 spam makes a lot of sense. It gives you that vision. I'm assuming we're going to go for ticks here. That's really the option that makes sense as an Armada commander. Go for a whole bunch of ticks right here, and then eventually those Starlights can just fall behind them as slowly as you want, because it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter if they crawl at a snail's pace. Every inch they take is an inch gained. And it all goes back to funding your war effort. Only takes one shot, by the way, to blast away one of these Quakers each time the pencil necks get a chance. I want a, I want a little clip of these. The mighty giraffe, roaming across the plains of Supreme Isthmus, searching desperately for a target among the enemy. And here it comes, locking onto a juicy target here. Oh, never mind. The geothermal has been obliterated already. <laughs> There's the bombing run. Love to see that on time. Uh, we do have a chainsaw up and running, so that'll at the very least be quite nice for uh, shooting down some of this. Uh, bombers do drop their payload. Oh, it's so close. Yeah, I think there's enough bombers. Beautiful connection right there. Massive bombing run. Completely shutting down the blue production center right there. That was about to be absolutely tremendous. Well, you know what? I might have already been. There's so many, t so many ticks that already went out on the field. Starlights are still pushing forward regardless of all that. The biggest crisis is that those don't have any power anymore. Smooth move right there from the blue commander, handing those off immediately to Sinobi. I wonder if that was the right commander choice. Oh, Bomber's still in the back line, by the way. Didn't get completely shot down, and because the uh, fighter, well, it jumped on top of the air player right here, it means the fighters aren't going to be able to come out. It's actually a really nice bombing run right there. Either way, though, the front door is wide open here for the red team. Do we have enough to seal it back up once again? Chicken lips in desperate trouble. Yeah, suddenly the medium tanks. Just good old T1 medium tanks rolling in here. Flamethrower turrets are up, by the way. They do a huge amount of damage, so you definitely don't want to keep your uh, shell shockers, of all things, or your wolverines, of all things, within range of those. Certainly less than ideal, but not the end of the world. Wow. We have a big salamander push over here. Who can hit the other the fastest and the hardest and right in the face? 
That bombing run took out the major tech center right here for the blue team. Still took out a whole bunch of tech in the back line as well, including the T2 laboratory here for the green team. And now Salamanders are rolling up the beachhead to try and take out the cyan green team or the lime green team. Hey, you know what? This is a little more equal than I thought here. The red team actually having a metal advantage right now, despite their uh, front lines being in complete shambles. This is one of those weird games where you have the advantage, but it just doesn't feel like it because so much has been eviscerated. At the very least, the Orange Commander is still sticking in the game here, pumping out a whole bunch of blitzes, and I think that's actually a fairly good response, especially considering the ma the vast majority of the units that have been sent across the map here have essentially all been T1. Still, these Starlights are blasting way over here. The T2 lab does fall, and that definitely hurts. Production is cut off uh, once that T2 lab falls right there, and the Geothermal will not be too long after. Boom, it goes. 300 energy per second cut out of the power production plans here for the Maroon Commander. Definitely quite difficult to deal with. We have a single missile truck firing away. It's a Silver Star missile truck at this point. Doing his job slowly, but sure. Oh, well, not anymore. <laughs> sure again, trying to put a band-aid on all this, but there's just no way. Salamanders, the real band-aid here. Shutting down the economy right now for the blue team. My goodness, what an excellent little base trade like that. Despite that fabulous push from the blue team, the red team still managed to find a way to contribute quite a lot of damage over here. How on earth did we build Salamanders, by the way? This is an Armada commander. <laughs> Maybe they were given over by some other commander. They must have been, yeah. They must have been built by somebody else and handed over at some point. This is just too much, though, from the blue team, right? I mean, the, the, the orange units are going to be cleaned up eventually. There's another Salamander in the back line. Slowly working away on a uh, Amex over there. But I think this is really where the story is told. There's so much blue already on the red side of the map here. Tons and tons of Blitz is coming out even more and more every second right now. We're on triple lab Blitz spam. 95 metal per second to build a 109 metal tank. I think two labs might about work. I think three labs might be overkill. We do have uh, butlers, by the way, building a whole bunch of wind turbines. Always a fun way of up upping the energy income, going for those butlers into the wind turbines. It's been a popular strategy as of late. Love the res bots included in this, by the way, to try and eat up as much of that metal as possible. Feed it back to the blue team. Walrus 7790, though, has won the naval battle over on this side. We do have the red subs patching things up, but I think at this point, you've steadily gained the advantage, and it's about time that you just transition into full-blown uh, full T2 production here. Yeah, certainly we can eat a lot of this metal up and just send it back. Oh, we actually have a critical east all right here from Walrus. We desperately need some tidal generators. Wouldn't mind seeing a startup construction of those somewhere along the lines, or maybe even some advanced solars in the back here. Anything to get the energy production up and running. This uh, salamander having a field day right now. <laughs> it's the hero the red team needs. Still neck and neck in metal production, just about. Energy production here, though, definitely goes to the red team. Red commander still has a geothermal. Still also has his lab up here. We do have a uh, halfway completed cloakable fusion reactor. Actually love to see that. Cloakable fusion reactor is a little underrated, in my opinion. They do offer quite a lot of power production for the fact that you can keep them completely concealed. I don't know. I think it's a pretty useful trait. There we go. Just like that. 1,100, well, 1,050 while it's cloaked. Energy per second coming into the red player's economy. And the blue team will never know about it. Meanwhile, Eggroll has decided to confidently, brazenly storm the beaches. <laughs> You're gonna need to cloak that commander, my friend. There we go. We do cloak the commander eventually here. Not enough energy production quite yet in order to keep that completely cloaked, though. Antinuke boat's coming up here. Uh, more than anti-nukes, though, they're also generator boats, so you can see they actually produce 300 energy per second. Now, mo a lot of that is mitigated by the fact that they also consume a lot of energy to charge their anti-nuke silos. But still quite nice. A nice bombing run over here. Yeah, actually a killer bombing run over here. It takes down a whole bunch of these boats. We are reclaiming at this point. Well, we're halfway reclaiming. We're reclaiming and resurrecting at the same time. Always risky when you do that because you risk eating and rebuilding a ship at the same time, locking your constructors in a little bit of a weird stalemate. More bombers coming in. Very nice. Going to target down, well, two of those mexes. There's still a third right there. Could have easily spread out those attacks. Maybe that's a point of learning as well. You can hit A and then right-click and drag to spread all the attacks. Every one of those dots is somewhere where the bombers will try to drop their bombs. 
Well, you know what? The anti-air is up in time as well as the fighters, and so I think these bombers will eventually go down. Yeah, nicely done right there by the green commander as well as the cyan. Managing to keep this base alive, or at the very least the fusion reactor alive. I think that was really the critical part here. Build power goes down, which is definitely a pain, but shouldn't be the end of the world to try and rebuild. Blue commander's still in it, by the way. Trying to rebuild that geothermal from the ashes of a civilization that once was. Always difficult. This is a weird spot. This is a weird spot for both teams. Neither one's sure whether they should just continue building up a whole bunch of T1 army or they should just start uh, going up the tech tree here. Really inconvenient for either one to make that transition because it does mean that essentially uh, uh, the, the rest of your team is dealing with your fourth of the share of the damage coming in at any given moment. It can be quite awkward. This is a great catch over here. Bunch of fighters catch the gunships. T2 fighters on T2 gunships shoot those down pretty quick. Especially if they ball up like that. Ooh, you gotta be so careful. If they ball up like that, and especially if they land, two or three fighters can take them all out because despite not having any AOE, if they start to collide with each other, and air has no collision box, so they just will pile up on top of each other, and it means that a single missile can hit all of them simultaneously. That's why it's so critical that if you're controlling your gunships, you don't right-click on any one spot. You have to always make sure to click and drag. Gets me a little worried there, not gonna lie. Love this little backed-up position over here for the Red Commander. So extremely prone to uh, bombardment from long-range missile ships. I'm surprised we haven't gone for that already. I guess we're going for T2 economy in the, in the pool here. But man, what a neck-and-neck -neck game still. Frigates, by the way, can't see underwater, so they're unaware of the metal extractor that still exists here for the Yellow Commander. I think it's about time we try and clear our ocean out here. It's also time we upgrade these metal extractors, guys. 4.5 metal. You gotta remember that that, or sorry, 4.3 metal. It gets multiplied by 4 when you upgraded those T2 metal extractors. Well worth it on the front lines right here. Blue team has no reason not to have claimed all these metal extractors right here. They're really throwing the lead back to the uh, red team. Giving them the opportunity to come back here by not eating up all this metal first and foremost, and then secondly, not actually taking all the metal extractors and taking that massive advantage. Hmm. Not what I like to see. Where are the missile boats? I think the purple commander has forgotten about... Oh, there we go. We do have some missile, missile ships coming up here. Uh, messengers, cruise missile ships. Eventually are going to start barraging this base in red over here. They can kill all of this. If we see a tachyon come up, the uh, the pulsar tachyon weapon. Technically, those are outranged by the missile ships as well, but a lot of times they can sort of get the snipe off on the missile boat because it'll loiter a little too close to the laser beam. Can oftentimes be quite useful. And a whole bunch of scout crafter built here. I like the clarity from the red team. You can definitely tell the red team has a, a vision right here. They're trying to rebuild into this as efficiently as possible right now, where it feels like the blue team is sort of flailing around. There's not that that it's that same concerted vision that we had at the start of this game here. Going into a uh, full-blown T2 economy right now for the blue team. For the blue player, pardon me. Fruit, that is. Starts up the Aphis here. Going to start up a whole bunch of those energy converters as well. We actually should have started an energy converter first and foremost. The uh, energy converters obviously can benefit from the advanced geo or the advanced geo can benefit from the energy converters or maybe it's just safe to say that the blue player can benefit from all of the above weird to see a medium tank battle at this point in the game we went all the way up to t2 and then all the way back down to t1 medium tanks what a bizarre kind of a shape of battle <laughs> let's turn on our metal vision here nope not that one there we go turn on our metal vision to see 5,000 metal sitting in ruin right here absolutely well worth building a couple of res bots or just taking the ones you have and sending them up there yeah it looks like bearded coder recognizes that thank goodness one too many times have i seen commanders ignore a massive wreckage pile like that and just let it sit there only for their enemy to make a big push reclaim it all and then make their big push an even bigger push Finally, by the way, Walrus does clean up the ocean over here. Save for the single metal extractor lingering under the seas. Again, frigates don't actually have vision over the, uh, or well, under the water. They have vision over the water, but not under the water. It means that they uh, tend not to discover metal extractors that are built under the water. Resurrection Command, patching these metal extractors back up. I mean, based on reclaim right here, both teams are essentially neck and neck. The blue team eventually coming into a slight lead mostly I think that's just the metal from these tanks right here though we're continuing to send the tanks in 
So bear with me for a second, but if we had 9,000 metal worth of tanks and, I don't know, 9,000 metal worth of T2 tanks, or subtract 2,000 from 9,000, call it 7,000-ish, uh, maybe closer to 6,000-ish metal worth of heavy tanks, I think would be two, if not three, if not four times as effective as that much metal in T1 tanks, or rather, that much metal plus 3,000 extra in T1 tanks. Does that make sense? Does my math make sense there? I hope it makes sense. Feel free to leave a comment if it doesn't, and I can elaborate further. Bearded Coder. Still lingering on the front line, and normally by this point in the game, I would say that's a bad idea, but because it's all still medium tanks, I guess it doesn't really matter. It's actually a great spot for the commander, because medium tanks, one of those things the commander is great at stopping. My goodness, though, we're just going for more and more medium tanks. What an absolutely wild strategy. The plan here is to continue punching. And if that doesn't work, we're just going to continue punching. I don't know what the plan is if punching doesn't work, though. It's probably just to continue punching. <laughs> In the end, it was his own flamethrower turret that killed Taxation is Theft, and uh, indeed the entire front line. There we go. Heavy tanks. Uh, a little late to the battle here. The bulls up in the northern side. This T2 lab is up and running, and I think it was absolutely the right idea six minutes ago. This is frustrating. This is very frustrating to see. Geothermal goes down. Bulls finally get involved over here, and they'll shut all this down lickety-split, especially if those tanks are clumped up right here. Uh, that being said, the tanks clumped up on the bulls are going to cause quite a lot of friendly fire, so that's a bit of a problem as well. Shuriken up in the air trying their very best, though, and I think the Shuriken are going to be the saving grace right here, keeping the blue team from complete annihilation. But man, what a, uh, what a ridiculous comeback right here from the orange commander. All thanks to these bad boys, the uh, lovely little butlers in orange who built so many of these wind turbines. How many wind turbines is this in total? Minus, whoops, pardon me. Minus the wind turbines in pink, 488 wind turbines, a cool 18,000 wind turbines. So essentially, if exactly double the cost of a uh, advanced fusion reactor for Almost the same energy production, at least at high wind speed. Not bad. So we do have some drones out here as well. The uh, drone carrier ship from those new T2 boats. Always cool to see. Oh, look, it's doing pretty good, actually. I would say Buccaneer is probably not the ideal solution to the Lunkheads. Typically, the destroyers end up doing a little bit better. We're all the way up to T3. My goodness. The red team... Don't tell me the red team is coming back right now. There's absolutely no way. The blue team had this game in the bag. They just had to push in and finish out the fight, reclaim it all, and then turn it into a T3 advantage. My goodness. They're actually doing it. The constant stream of T1 medium tanks to the front lines here. Are we going to reclaim any of them? It looks like the plan is to. We do have res, res bots eating up some of this nine or so thousand metal on the fronts here. Juno missiles fired across, by the way. Love to see that. Buccaneers do spy, by the way, the uh, incoming Marauder over here. Hopefully we have some sort of a reaction from the blue team. We desperately, desperately need some sort of a reaction right now from the blue commander. Ooh, that Aphis isn't going to save you from the Marauders. In fact, it might doom you. Oh, no. The Marauder are getting quite scuffed up, so that might be the saving grace right here, but man... As soon as they make landfall, these can be a huge, huge problem for the blue team. Where are they headed, though? I don't get why the Marauder are fighting this fight. Marauder easily outpaced these boats, and there's no reason they couldn't just go around and make landfall. Uh, I tried to self-D that one. I like the idea of it, just a little too slow on it. After whatever that battle was, five Marauder do eventually make it out here. Lightning tanks will be piled on the shoreline in order to deal with them. Okay. It's a fair enough response. It's not a perfect response, but there's not really time to build anything that would be. And you know what? All said and done. Well, okay. Not done yet. Finish the mission. <laughs> there we go. All said and done, lightning tanks do shut down the Marauder right there. I'm not sure why we were dancing around in the middle of the map right there with the Marauder. I think if all the Marauder had pushed right there, the lightning tanks would not have been enough and he would have been able to break through. Unfortunately, not the case right there. And so the Red Commander is back to square one right now. 
Geo has been popped by the way by the missile ships, no doubt. Vanguard is now firing away from long range. That's always cool to see. Gonna be shelling away at a lot of those boats out in the ocean. Very uncomfortable to sit around over here. And my goodness, does this thing have a range? Can fire out for absolute miles. Finally, T2 tanks are here on the front lines to reinforce. We did allow the pink commander at the very least to get all the way back up to T2, but it's not going to matter. There's not enough units on the field here. Lightning tanks, the Jaguar, going to be pushing into this base and eviscerating it. All the constructors go down, the build towers next, and eventually the lab itself. Bulls pushing in as fire support in the back end of this. Not like it's really needed here. Those lightning tanks do crazy damage, but the bulls, I guess, just a little bit of icing on top of the cake. Orange commander is up to T2, though, and I'm glad to see it. We don't have any Aphis scaling, though. It's the one thing that I think would save the red team right now, is a big old ball of Aphis pumping out energy for everybody to take advantage of. Salamanders push their way up the shoreline here, ravaging the base of the yellow commander, but those bulls in brown going to blast them down, and i like to see a reclaim on these eventually. Actually, you know what I'd like to see more than that is a res on these. Resurrecting these and then sending them back across the map, I think that'd be really cool to see. AA trucks have also been built here, that's quite nice. Easy to forget, but those AA trucks can be extremely powerful. Ah, don't just sacrifice the Starlights. The Orange Commander has a queue set up that's essentially just sending units across the map right now, but it's really not the efficient way to use them, and I would love to see it. Uh, it being the units in orange used a little more efficiently here. Res subs, uh, res bots rather, the, the res subs of the land, eating up all the metal over here in the orange base that once existed. Bulls eventually blasting down those Marauder. Bulls are actually more expensive than Marauder, but they're T2, so I feel like they basically equal out, right? They should basically be the same. That's bar math. You've heard of girl math and boy math, but that's bar math. Starlights blasting away at each other right now. I'll take the one with more starlights per square inch. Gonna be the blue commander, at least for the time being. Defense advantage is real though, and eventually these bulls will be blasted to smithereens right here. I'm not saying this is the wrong answer, but certainly heavy losses right here from the orange commander. More tigers and more salamanders, though. The red team forced back into their corner. The red player feeling that on multiple levels here. Upper tank's definitely doing a decent job at applying counter pressure here. The vanguard up on the hill, though, is much more impactful. It looks like there was two shots there. Oh, there was two shots. Yeah, there's two vanguard over here firing away at whatever they can. Love to see that. Easy to forget about those vanguards. They kind of get overshadowed by a lot of the other powerful armada stuff. The Razorback, the Titan, the Thor. Just to name some of the ones that we're probably all already well familiar with. So the nice thing, I mean, is that these Starlights aren't going to target down the economy over here because, well, they just can't see it, can't detect it. And you can't hit what you can't see. Which actually isn't true in bar. <laughs> you can totally hit what you can't see, which is why these Starlights might accidentally clip this fusion reactor right here when they're trying to shoot at this metal extractor. Same with this bull. Yeah. The bull's gonna accidentally shoot at this fusion reactor because it can't hit the metal extractor. It tries to, but it can't. Oh no. Energy converters pop. Not good. At the very least, the pit bulls will pop up and shut down a bunch of those heavy tanks that pushed into that base. Not quite enough to break the red commander there. Certainly getting pretty damn close, though. Beautiful Deegan right there. Killer Deegan's right there from Hab Gear. Manages to blast it. Well, the last one was a little unnecessary. But anyway, manages to blast away the entire bowl of heavy tanks that was pushing in from this, this point of the game. There we go. We do have some bombers coming in. I was just about to say, I think the blue team needs to start considering it game enders here. At this point, the economies have long since diverged. The blue commander has gotten way back into this game. We've got fighter production in mass right here. We've got double Aphis economy. We're more than ready to start figuring out a way to end this game. And I think this push right here with the fighters is definitely going to be worth it. How do you properly defend against this? I think the right thing to do would be to push the flag trucks forward, pull the fighters back, save the fighters to snipe the bombers, and then use the uh, flag trucks to kind of try and kill as many of the fighters as you possibly can. Cuts down on your fighter losses. It means that your trade eventually against the bombers is going to be quite a bit more efficient. Eh, wasn't perfect, and it just wasn't quite enough flag. Here come the bombers, avoiding the flag trucks over there. Boom goes the Aphis for the hot pink player, as well as the second one, sending a chain reaction through the orange wind turbines over here on the left-hand side. Butler's trying desperately to build as many wind turbines as possible over here, but not going to be the case. 
that those wind turbines end up saving the day as the bombers come in to seal the deal right now for the blue team and i think it's just about time that we see the red team yielding to the yielding to the force of the blue more bombers sacrificing their lives they're uh gonna crash and burn to the ground here i guess that's their way of bombing very legion-esque way of bombing right there not bad Voters canceled. Okay. Red team still feels like they can stick in this. I think the odds are quite low right here. After losing this base over here and with scout planes casually parked in your back line. Never a good look. Scout planes all over the place. Making this quite difficult. The red team. Unable to do anything without prying eyes looking away, looking towards them. Vanguard continuing to be a nuisance though. Oh, they're just dumb firing though, which is kind of a bummer. Would love to see them actually firing away at something useful. Maybe building a scout plane or two and sending them over in that direction. Just anything to make them a little more potent. Wouldn't be the end of the world. The Thor is out here. Fruit's commander is on the front line, though. We might as well just walk the commander forward, I feel like, for the blue, blue team leader. He's got two commanders, actually. The blue team with seven commanders, by the way. The red team with just one. I'm going to go ahead and speed up this match. I think we all may sense where exactly this game is going to go eventually. Ah, there we go. All right. The red team does eventually decide to throw in the towel here as the blue team's weight was eventually overwhelming. Love the play with the nuclear bomber, but my goodness, was it close right there with the red team pushing back quite tremendously. I think if the red team had been a little more on par with the reclaim on all those fields of tanks and then eventually also rebuilt their metal extractors, would have been quite difficult for all the aggression on the beachhead, but definitely not impossible. I think they definitely had a chance, but in the end, it'll be the blue team who manages to take victory in this game of Beyond All Reason. Sure hope you enjoyed this one, and if you'd like to see daily Beyond All Reason videos, you're more than welcome to hit that subscribe button and join up on the Brightworks. Always happy to have a new member join every single day. Just gets me giddy, and I will see you in the very next game. Peace out, everybody.